Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for those of you in our live audience for uh, braving the, uh, the atmospheric river, which is a term I've learned since moving here to Portland. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit about progressive education this evening. Uh, before I begin, though, I'd like to thank the IT and facilities team for making this evening possible and for all of the efforts of our enrollment management team uh, to bring this event together. My name is Kama Bruce, and I'm the assistant head of school here at Catlin Gable, and proudly so, and uh, new to Portland, as I just stated, this is my second winter, and uh, needless to say, I'm still excited to be here. Um, when I really think about education, I think about what it means for each child to discover his, her, their purpose in life. Who are they? How do they fit? And how are they going to make a difference? And nothing highlights that more than watching and observing and basking in the voices of young children as they're made more and more curious by the world that they are receiving. When I was a kid, it was a little bit different. So I can tell you for certain that Catlin Gable is a destination school for me. Secretly, that little boy in me wanted to be in a school like this. And as I always do, I always like to start with a story. I remember being in third grade, full of excitement. It's the first day of school, meeting old and new classmates and a new teacher, a new environment, a new grade, a new opportunity. And it was at the end of that day that I had a life-changing formative experience. I was one of two black children in the school, unbeknownst to me. The other was in kindergarten. And the teacher was sorting us out, who was going to walk home, who was gonna catch the bus, and who was gonna pick up their siblings. And the teacher said, comma, uh, why don't you go ahead and get in this line so that way you can go in and pick up your younger sibling in kindergarten? And I said, I don't have a sibling in kindergarten. And the teacher said, well, you shouldn't be ashamed of having a younger brother. And I said, I'm not. I don't have a younger brother. And uh, she said, you know, if you continue to lie to me, I'm going to have to send a note home to your parents. And at that point, I began to cry, and she walked me down to the kindergarten, whereby the kindergarten teacher told her, politely that uh, we were indeed not siblings. And she sent me on my way. She didn't apologize. She didn't recognize that moment for that formative opportunity in the other direction where I could have grown in relationship. And you might be telling yourselves, wow, that's a really circuitous way to be talking about Catlin Gable. But I'm doing that to highlight a point, that a true educational journey begins with relationship. And that is what Catlin Gable does exceptionally well. We get to be with your children each and every day, eight hours a day, five days a week, to experience the magic of the world unfolding for each of them. That's a blessing and an opportunity and a responsibility. And we do that through progressive education, which begins with a question compounded by curiosity and built upon agency. The idea that each child is able to have determination within that journey. And as you see that progression through the years at a school like this, you get to watch the students grow into fuller versions of themselves each and every day, each and every year, to become agents of change in the world that they will receive, voices of compassion to the people that they will be servant leaders to. With a mission to change the world and to empower each child, and through values of integrity, kindness, and inclusion, we go about this very intentionally and meticulously. Not because it is easy, but rather because it is hard. The ways in which we educate children 
are about co-creating those journeys and being responsive. It's not about telling you that on day 141 of the school year that we'll be on page 57 of the textbook looking at problem number three, but rather that there's a beauty in knowing that the children can be our guides and that we as professionals can lean in and be exceptional partners in a journey that is unique to each. We focus on beginning with the whole child, understanding that each person is in process, understanding themselves in more unique and complicated ways each day, and knowing that we can attend to all of those different things through a variety of different specialists, different experiences, on a vast Woodland campus with students ages four through 18. So many opportunities to engage and unpack and explore. We build upon the natural curiosity that children bring. We teach them to ask a more beautiful question. We ask them to think about not necessarily the answer, but the different perspectives. We engage with them so that they can understand the questions that are emerging around them and think about the questions that precipitate from those. We teach for democracy because we know that the world is complicated and that as adults we're not always the best models. We teach for democracy so that children can learn to listen, not to win, but to understand. We teach for democracy so that children can enter into discourse and understand that they are safe in talking about ideas. And that being engaged is about understanding the myriad perspectives that you'll receive on a daily basis. All of those things compounded certainly support the education that your children are considering when they're looking at Catlin Gable. And I know that as families, there's so many questions when you think about that horizon of who your children will become. But I can say with confidence, as a parent with a fourth and fifth grader here, who are looking towards that next experience with pride and joy and enthusiasm, that it's certainly a great partner to have in that journey. And I can think of no other person I'd like to introduce more tonight than Nick Zozo Johnson, head of our beginning in lower schools, who has not only been a phenomenal addition to our leadership team, but is exceptional in his knowledge of progressive education, adroit in his compassionate leadership, and certainly a service-oriented partner for all of you as you consider this school. Nick? It's great to be here with you all tonight. I'd love to just get a little bit of a sense of who's in the room. So let's do a quick uh, survey. How many of you have um, students who are preschool or kindergarten age looking at preschool or kindergarten? Great. Okay, a lot. How about grades one and two? Okay, how about three, four, five? Okay, how many of you have students who would be middle school or high school as well? A couple? Okay, great, great. Okay, it's really helpful to know who's in the space tonight. Um, we're just really happy to be here with you. How many of you have been to an event before, either a tour, an open house, or, or listened to us before? Just a quick show of hands, how many have been here? Okay, awesome, that's what I thought. So I was anticipating a group of people who've been to open houses. Uh, many of you have had the chance to be on a tour. And so tonight, we're just really excited to have our teachers um, share with you what learning really looks like. So the big goal for tonight is for us to help translate some of our philosophical beliefs into um, what that really looks like day to day in the classroom. So we have uh, three of our educators here tonight, and they're gonna share with you some really great examples of what learning looks like in the classroom. Um, to get started tonight, though, I just have a few opening remarks to help frame that, and then we'll get right to um, our teachers. So I actually wanna to start tonight with a story I told at Back to School Night uh, this year, and this is a theme that we have been thinking about as a faculty. Uh, so when I was a six, I had a fish, and his name was Herman. And he was a goldfish, much like this goldfish. And my sister and I loved Herman very much. And one day we came home and my sister decided that Herman needed a meal. And so like I, she was two years older than me, she went and got a tuna fish sandwich 
and she dropped it in the tank. Um, Herman didn't make it. And my sister and I were devastated that Herman didn't make it. Um, and so my mom, I remember this so clearly, went with the net, went over and fished Herman out. And we all walked together over to the toilet. And my mom said, we're going to send Herman to the vet. So we dropped Herman in the toilet, we sent him to the vet, and the next day we went to the pet store and lo and behold, there was Herman healed, miraculously, uh, ready to go. So we took Herman home. So fast forward 30 years, here I am one evening in our house and my four-year-old daughter uh, is asleep and I walk by the fish tank and her first fish, rainbow Nemo pancakes, is floating at the top of the tank. And I have that moment of sheer panic as a parent, right? I haven't experienced this moment yet. I'm not certain what to do. And then I remember my mom and the vet, and I think, I've got it. We're gonna send rainbow Nemo pancakes to the vet. Uh, but I had a moment of pause, and I thought, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. So I called an early childhood educator who I really respected and had worked with for years, and I said, what do I do? My, my daughter's first pet just died. And then I said, so what I'm thinking I'm going to do is send it to the vet. What do you think of that? <laughs> and she paused and she took a deep breath and she said, Nick, it's the little things that prepare kids for the big things. It's the little things that prepare kids for the big things. And it still resonates today and has been a theme we've been thinking about. It really is the little things that prepare children for the big things. And that is certainly the belief we hold um, closely as, as we work with children and support families in raising children. Um, as I landed here, it's been really helpful to try to think about our core documents and how they, they help explain the experience children will have. So the mission statement I like to think of is like the why. Why do we exist in this world? Uh, the values, as Tim Bazemore, head of school, says, are, are sort of how we show up each day to do the work. Um, the principles of progressive education, I like to think of as the way we accomplish our goals. Um, it's the pedagogical approach that we all share. Um, and then this image of a learner is really important to us, um, which is these are the skills that we hope children exiting the program will attain prior to leaving. So these are like the transcendent skills we want to be sure kids attain before they leave. Um, so tonight, as we go forward, I just want to touch on three areas um, that sort of frame the program for us. Um, and then I think you'll see examples of each of these uh, in the remarks from our educators tonight. Uh, so the, the first piece is social-emotional learning. Social-emotional learning is such a critical piece of growing up and such a key component of the BLS experience. From our honeybees who join us as four-year-olds all the way through our fifth grade students, uh, Social-emotional learning is a key piece of every day. It's baked into every part of what we do. And much of this is really explicit, which I think you'll see tonight. Kids, kids need help here. They need guidance. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have bumps. And it's our job as educators to help them navigate those bumps authentically. Um, so the three really big ideas that we work on is making sure that every child is connected, that every child is connected to friends, to peers, um, that they, they feel like this is a place where they're safe and that they belong, that they're connected to adults in our community too. The next piece is we wanna be sure that every child is authentically engaged, that they care about what they're working on and that they have the tools and the support necessary to be successful. And then a third piece that we work on is regulation. Uh, this is a big thing, right? Four-year-olds don't just enter the world as regulated little human beings. They need help, and so do big kids too sometimes. And we really see it as our role to help kids learn how to regulate and what that looks like. Um, so this can sometimes mean at our circles in the morning, we're asking big questions like, what does it look like to be in community? What do we do when we hurt somebody's feeling? Um, it might even be really simple, like, what do you do if two kids wanna share a ball? That might actually take some explicit problem solving. Um, the next piece I want to talk about is um, a piece of our practices that we call restorative practices. Um, and this comes out of our climate guide. And it's really our approach to working with students and families um, uh, to, to build community. So many people are, are quite familiar with restorative practices and often will link back to the idea that when harm is done, uh, we would work to resolve that harm and to offer um, restoration. Um, and that's pretty well understood by most people. And within the broader umbrella of restorative practices, we really want that piece, the harm repair, to be just 20%. 
So the other 80% we actually really see as the most important piece, uh, which is the relationship building. Um, if we're going to try to repair a relationship, and Kama has pointed this out, and I so appreciate that, there's got to be a pre-existing relationship to repair. So you have to be in relationship in order to repair relationship. And we see this as really critical both for the students with one another, um, but also for families with us as a school. We need to be in relationship um, so that we can work through hard moments together. So practically, what does this look like? Like, How do we create a community? And I would say we're really intentional about this. And it can be anything from greeting families every day at the front door to the circles that happen every day in every classroom where children have a chance to share their voice, to problem solve, and to just enjoy being together. Um, other ways that this can look is that when we do see a challenge, we try to proactively lean into it and problem solve. So a couple examples. We have a group of very boisterous fourth and fifth graders this year. They love sports. They are extremely athletic and they are so competitive. And they were having a lot of conflict at recess. So we had to make a decision. What were we going to do? And at a lot of schools that I've been at, we might just say no soccer, no football for the next month. We'll try it again later. Um, but instead, we leaned in. We knew this mattered to the kids, and we also knew it was a skill deficit. They needed to learn how to play recess soccer, recess football, without pro rules. Um, but then how to like, just have fun, right? And so um, our, our Sarah, our PE teacher, came up with a plan to actually move the game to a bigger field and to put in place some explicit coaching. These kids don't have to go, but they want to. And they go every single day, every single recess, and they play five games, different game each day. And our PE teacher coaches those games every day, providing feedback and real learning. And the students are learning how to play collaboratively, how to be less uh, competitive, and how to just have fun together. Um, another example would be, if you've been on campus, you've probably noticed some forts in the Fir Grove, big stick fort building. And we had a bunch of first and second graders who really wanted to build stick forts. And as you can imagine, this isn't entirely straightforward, right? When you build a fort, you want it to stay. Hey, that's my stick. I love this stick. Uh, and there's lots of complication there. And we helped the kids um, learn how to do that and create agreements so that they could build forts, which is a really wonderful thing and builds a lot of community and is really fundamentally a piece of educating for democracy. This is a funny piece of culture here that I'll just share. In the front of the lower school, having a good stick is like a really important thing here. And so in the front foyer of the lower school, as you walk in, you'll often find sticks hidden. So there's a flower pot and you might just find like a, a nice stick there because someone's stashing it for the next recess, which I love about this place. It's sort of a tangential story, but I love that our kids are playing in nature and that they play so creatively in the space. Um, oh, there's the fort, yeah. So the next piece I wanted to talk a bit about is learning outcomes. So I think a lot of people come to schools, and if, if you didn't have the chance to go to a progressive school as a child, um, it can be hard to understand fully, like, what does progressive education mean? Um, sometimes people think uh, progressive ed means kids are doing whatever they want. They just get to go around, and if they're interested in it, they get to do it. And if they're not interested in it, they don't have to do that. And I just want to say that that's not how it works. Uh, so we really have clear learning outcomes that we've identified for students across all subjects. So what you're seeing here is an example of just one section of a kindergarten math learning outcomes uh, report that we would share with parents throughout the year. And these are the goals that the teachers are working on. Now, being a progressive school, we have a lot of latitude. So for example, if they're learning to count uh, by ones and tens, um, we don't just have to do that with rote counting. We can go out and the kids might tromp down to a pond and count tadpoles. Um, and so we can do, uh, we can make sure we're accomplishing these learning goals uh, with authentic hands-on learning. And that's one of our key, uh, key goals here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the school home partnership. Uh, so this is a really interesting time to be a parent, I, th I think. Uh, I'm a parent. I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And um, we are simultaneously more connected than we have ever been and more disconnected than we have ever been, uh, I think, as a society. One of the things that I found interesting with my second child, especially coming out of COVID, is there are all these new tools. And so when my son was in, in child care, um, there were all these apps. And I started getting alerts, like he ate three grapes, he had two Cheerios, diaper change, diaper change again. And I was not someone, like, I would drop him off at childcare in the morning, and I wouldn't worry about it. I'd just pick him up at the end of the day. He'd be smiling. Everything was great. But I started getting all those notifications, and then 
when they were busy, and I'm sure the teachers were teaching, I would start to wonder by like noon if there wasn't a diaper change. Like, is he sick? Is he dehydrated? What's wrong? Um, and I think this places us in an interesting place as families um, as we think about what does partnership look like? What does authentic partnership look like? Um, Rob Evans, one of my favorite school psychologists um, who's been in the field for a long time, has this really helpful phrase where he talks about um, preparing the child for the road ahead instead of preparing the road for the child. That's when, and that really resonates for me. I think what we want to do here is we want to prepare children to, to have the skills to navigate the world independently. And what that means is that we want to partner with you as a family. We want to get to know you. We want to support your child. And we also want to make space for your child to develop independence. A lot of the most recent research suggests it's really important that kids have space to lead their own independent lives. And so we work hard to find that balance uh, with families. And with that, we're gonna shift gears now and I'm gonna pass it over to our educators. So tonight, what I think you'll see is those values that I just shared with you. I hope you really get to see those in the lessons that you're hearing about tonight. I know we have a lot of preschool families here and Hannah Hutchings was going to be the person to share with you some uh, preschool learning. Hannah is homesick and has laryngitis, I think, tonight, and so she wasn't able to present. But we're really lucky because Nicole uh, was her co-teacher last year in preschool and is really an early childhood expert. So Nicole's gonna actually talk about um, both some preschool experiences and some kindergarten experiences. So we'll welcome Nicole up and just thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Nicole? Hi, um, my name is N Nicole Simpson Tanner, and I um, was a preschool teacher with Hannah Hutchings for the last two years, but this year I moved to the second grade in the, the lower school. But this is a story that happened, um, Hannah and I, the first year together a couple years ago, um, and it's kind of an illustration of um, both what uh, Nick and Kama were talking about, thinking about play-based learning and um, education for democracy. Um, <clears throat> so. This is a story uh, about Lucia. It starts with Lucia. And so one day in the honeybee classroom, Lucia brought a creation to our reflection meeting that she had made dur during Explore. She worked really hard on this creation with paper, glue, tape, and small pieces of wire. And when she um, presented it to her um, community, she proudly held up her work and announced, it's a bird. And then all the other children like looked at it and asked her questions. And then one child in the community responded very matter-of-factly, that doesn't look like a bird. So Hannah and I both looked at each other like, OK, what's going to happen next? And then we look over to Lucia, and she's like, as matter-of-factly, more matter-of-factly, she um, said, yeah, it is a bird. And so she knew it was a bird and, and kind of let that comet kind of float um, above her. But we also saw this opportunity to help the, um, the community and the children to think about what it means to um, belong to a learning community and how we can help them um, challenge the idea that there is only one way a bird could look. So we wanted to think about um, how to celebrate diversity of thought and celebrate the everyday experience at looking at something and having a different idea or perspective than someone um, next to you. Because the more we practice that the, and the more strategies we get, the more um, our community can be more welcoming and everyone can be, uh, have that sense of belonging. So the next day, um, on our morning message, we, um, the children walked in, and it says, today we are going to do an experiment. We wonder, what will your bird look like? And so we invited the children, all the children, to um, create their birds. And so we had um, different uh, materials available, um, of various amount of materials, like loose parts and light and shadow, and markers and pen and paint and of course tape and glue and wire. And so the children got, um, got busy um, creating birds and this was just really thinking about like what becomes possible when we value diversity of thought over uniformity. So um, the classroom was filled with birds of all different shapes and sizes and looks. And when we got together, we put them all in the middle and kind of um, 
like reflected it and commented of, uh, in comparing. And someone said, wow, none of them are the same. And so all the, and when we looked at all the birds, they, are, they were like little reflections of each, of each kid of who created those birds together. And they were all different. So this is kind of thinking that, you know, we want children to feel safe and brave enough to share in meetings and to share their ideas and also be respected um, by their community. And we wanted to um, move past the necessary discomfort of it doesn't look like a bird. Um, we could have stayed in that moment of, of tension, but we wanted to play with it um, until we reached connection. Um, children will always bring new perspectives, solutions, and possibilities if we listen and we invite them to share and work together. So when we value diversity, um, um, again, when we div value diversity over ideas of uniformity, everyone's ideas matter and we all belong. So we believe in, um, in the um, beginning school, beginning and lower school that um, that the practice that we provide children inside our classrooms give them authentic learning experiences and democratic living. So these are the stories that they develop and about who they are and, <clears throat> and what their role is when they meet conflict and exclusion and tolerance and injustice. And, um, and those things are defined by the conditions of the power and the sy power systems around them. So these moments are foundational to their emerging identities and can be applied to other areas of their lives as they grow. And then we celebrate everyone's bird. And now I'll give you a little um, um, sneak peek inside of early literacy um, in um, preschool through second grade and kind of um, reaching up to fifth grade too. So the literacy in the um, beginning and lower, lower school, and we have some pictures to kind of um, uh, show some sneak peeks. Um, the literacy consists of reading, writing, phonemic awareness and phonics, word study, speaking and listening, and it's connected to interdisciplinary subjects like social studies and science and um, other specials. But literacy in the beginning and lower school is also storytelling creating, making, crafting, and building, observing, collaborating, acting in drama, noticing and wondering, collecting data through all the senses, metacognition, paying attention to the world. It's meaningful and playful, and it's everywhere. So I like to um, think about this quote um, from Brazilian educator and philosopher, um, Paulo Freire. Um, and it, um, in, in it, he says, reading is not exhausted merely by decoding the written word or written language, but rather anticipated by and extending into knowledge of the world. Reading the world precedes reading the word, and the subsequent reading of the word cannot dispense with continually reading the world. Language and reality are dynamically intertwined, the understanding attained by critical reading of a text implies perceiving the relationship between text and context. And so what I um, think that this means <laughs> is that we are out um, reading the world through um, collecting data through all of our senses and um, constantly um, reading everything that's around us and um, texts live everywhere. So literacy is more than reading and writing. It's a way to make sense of the world. Learners actively pursue the meaning of life and the world around them. And learners are influenced by the relationships they form with people, animals, objects, and the spe um, special places that they explore. So reading both words and the world forges connections between known and new information. So this brings us to a little story um, I have about um, our first day of our new unit that we started a, a few weeks ago. Um, it was a new nonfiction unit, both reading and writing, and kind of um, diving in into the idea or, or into the world of nonfiction texts. And so um, before bringing out all the books that I gathered from the library, um, I want to take, take a step back and just start and 
introduce other texts for the children to get more information about real things. So we were reading objects to be fascinated. So um, for the beginning of our nonfiction unit, I brought in different things from home, and I had most of these at my house, um, things like a Polaroid camera and a cassette tape, and a bird nest and a beautiful shell, uh, a jawbone from somewhere, <laughs> um, different kind of feathers and flowers, and different things for the kids to put their, take, get their hands on and work with partners to kind of read these these um, objects and some of the questions were like, can you read these ordinary or maybe not so ordinary objects and how can you use what you already know or your schema to make sense of, of new or different objects? And so the children um, talked a lot about what they were noticing, what they were wondering and what they are learning and um, they really enjoyed the the land camera and the tape they thought they said it was a v it was a mo you play movies your mom and dad play movies on it that's what they said <laughs> and so then after that we um, we um, sent them out to read some more, but again, instead of giving them um, nonfiction books and other books that I got from the library, we, I sent them out with um, charts and graphs and um, other things to kind of like, you know, dive into and dig deeper into and see like um, what they could gather from the different objects um, and what information could they gather from that along with their partners. So emerging from the captivating stories told by our fascinating artifacts, the children continued their reading journey. Instead of diving into familiar books as texts, they were met with the discovery that joy and meaning reside not only within the pages of books, but also in the rich textures of charts and graphs, maps and globes, photographs and models. And so um, since then, um, after that first day, then we, we dove into books and we were writing teaching books for the honeybees of the things that we know a lot of information about that we want to share. And we're reading um, books connected to our big idea, which is a sense of place, thinking about the things that are on our campus and thinking about the forest that, um, that lives around us. And, thinking about trees and maps and, and whatnot. So um, here are some examples of how literacy is everywhere. It is playful and it is meaningful. And so um, you will notice some pictures looks like you know what you would think of when you think of literacy, like reading and writing, but it also looks like creating and making and observing and playing and working together. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from um, third grade teacher Herb, and, um, and he will talk about math. All right. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about math, what it looks like in the lower school. Um, going to start out kind of big and then zoom in a little bit. Let's go in the right direction, though. I also have a quote. Um, this is from Addie. She's uh, new to our, our school this year. Uh, she said, third grade is really fun. I love math, and I think parents would enjoy this education. <laughs> I also think there's good reading, there's good books, and math is good. I just think this is a good place to be. <laughs> All right, so some of the big ideas that we're focusing on in math are not just about the conceptual pieces, but how do we approach math? How do we approach thinking? Um, all of these are, are really big ideas that we try to hold tight to, when it, whatever it is that we're doing. I was talking to Anna, our, uh, our math specialist in the beginning of lower school, and she was, she was highlighting the bottom one there. Uh, everyone can learn math to the highest levels. And she said, that can be hard for some people to, to really believe. Um, especially if you think about how most of us went through math education, which was memorize this, learn the steps for this. Um, and you might think, that was really hard, and I'm, there's no way I would have gone any higher in math. Um, but really, for some people, math might be easier. For some people, it might be harder. But if you do it the right way, if you get some good teaching and you put in that effort, everyone can learn math to the highest levels. Here is the Catlin Gable School Mathematics Instructional Philosophy. This was 
put together by a cadre of teachers from the beginning school, lower school, middle school, upper school. We all got together and said, what do we believe about math? Um, and this is what we came up with. The Catlin Gable Math Program develops students who are joyful and creative problem solvers that approach challenging mathematics with curiosity and perseverance. Through independent effort, communication, and collaboration, students investigate and analyze problems flexibly, construct their understanding of mathematical concepts, and develop the skills and strategies to pursue current and future endeavors. So you see, we tried to get a lot <laughs> in there. But as I look at that, and as I was getting ready for this, I'm just reinforced with, we do this. Um, right after we did this, it was nice because we had some workshops and trainings to think about, well, how do we actually implement this? What are the best practices? How do we engage in this and make it a reality? So I'd like to show you one example that I think illustrates it pretty well. In our uh, first unit of study in third grade, we start off with graphing, and it starts to lead into multiplication. And here's, here was one of the problems we worked on. Uh, May, Noah, and Priya were to make a bar graph to represent the number of triangles, squares, trapezoids, and hexagons in this collection of pattern blocks. May says the scale of the bar graph should be two. Noah says the scale of the bar graph should be five. Priya says the scale of the bar graph should be 10. So I handed this off. I've got groups of three students. They're working on the whiteboards, trying to figure out how do we make sense of this. And most of them are like, oh, well, it should be two, without really thinking about it and just thinking like, well, I can count by twos. So that's pretty easy. Um, but, and we'll just go ahead and go with that. But as you can see, when I start going through this a little bit more, there's a lot that the students are going to be working on with this. Uh, there is some counting, which is pretty easy for third graders. Uh, sorting, estimating, multiplicative thinking, partitioning, graphing, collaboration, communicating. So they start thinking, like, OK, well, how many of each piece do we have? And you can see they start recording some of the numbers of the pieces. And pretty quickly, it's like, well, twos is probably not going to be the best scale for this. Obviously, it's fives. Let's try some fives. And so then they start creating their graphs. And you can see they've got their scaled bar graph. They're counting by five. So you can see where the multiplication part is starting to come in here. It's like, all right, that's great. You've got that. Now let's take this piece of graph paper. Let's take this data. Check out those numbers. And what scale are you going to use now? So if you look at that, you might be thinking, oh, well, twos might be pretty good because we have a lot of even numbers there. Well, they start putting it together on the graph. And I don't know if you remember the number for summer, but it was 40. And this only goes up to 24. So what do you do? <laughs> you make the graph bigger. Or you make it really big. Or this is a great one. You go up. And then you come back down. <laughs> it fits. So one of the great things I really love about math is that there's always a logic to what they're doing. It makes sense. They've got this idea. It just may not work in how others might consider the problem. So now we're getting into some kids are like, oh, well, I can do it by fives. Then it fits. Or I can do it by fours. And so that's what we're getting towards, being able to problem solve and figure out how to make the problem work. Now let's get into how students learn math. We have this progression. The students work with a real concrete thinking, using objects, manipulatives. And then they can start doing drawings and models, diagrams. And eventually, we get into the numbers, where you can just think abstractly about how it's going. Now, it's a little bit too common that students are asked to work in the abstract right away. Oh, you're doing multiplication. Let me show you this times table. Let me show you this trick. You ever see that one with the nines, <laughs> right? There's all these little things that you can do to start memorizing, but that doesn't help you to really develop the foundation and understand what it is that you're doing. So let me show you what this might look like. Our next unit, we were working in. Uh, 
working on multiplication through area. So we started with the objects. We had some figures on a piece of paper. How many square inch tiles will it take to fill in the shape? So we're really understanding what does area mean. Then we start getting into some problems where they can draw the, the area model on the board. And you can see they've got, you know, they're skip counting and starting to, to develop these multiplication concepts that we're not asking them to memorize these tables or, or just learn it that way. And then they start to be able to understand it in terms of just the numbers. So I have a six by seven array. I can partition it into a six times five because I know fives and six times two because I know twos. So they're starting to work with a distributive property that we're not talking about that so much. But when they get into middle school and they're starting to do pre-algebra and algebra and they're getting into the distributive property, they're like, oh, that's like what we did in third grade. And it's familiar and they are ready, they've got the foundation. And here's a fun thing about this progression is it's not linear and that you've made it to this point, then you're good to go. If the problem changes, the concept changes, I'm going back to objects. So even though we've been working with area for a while, I gave them the challenge, I said, here's one square foot. How many square inches are there in that? Let's get those tiles out. <laughs> Let's start putting them on there and trying to count them and start figuring out. And by this time we are away from, let's count every single tile to, oh, well, I've got a row of 12 and another row of 12. And so they're figuring out more efficient strategies. Some students are into the drawings and they're like, I don't need the tiles, but I need to draw every single square on the board and then I can figure it out. And then some are starting to do this combination. Nobody in this problem ever got to the, the real abstract, oh, I can do this 12 times 12. But you can see they're starting. They've got, oh, I know two groups of 12 is 24, two groups of 24 is 48. And then they just kind of kept going and going and going. <laughs> this here is a picture of the last lesson in this area unit. And you can see We've got this room diagram, they're adding furniture, and they're trying to figure out how much of the room is not covered up by furniture. So it's this multi-step problem. They're starting to, they're not, they're not having to draw all the little squares, they're not having to put the tiles on there, but they're able to think like, oh, okay, well this is two feet by three feet, so that's gonna be six feet, and just work their way through that whole progression in just this one unit. Which brings us back to our math philosophy. There's a lot of creative problem solving going on here. They're working closely together. So mostly it's joyful, depending on the partnership and how it's going that day. Um, but we get a lot of curiosity. We get a lot of the communication, trying to explain their thinking. Um, in this picture, there's two groups who are comparing. They got different answers. And so it's like, well, how, what, why is that? And that's what math looks like. Robin? Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Leventhal, and I am the science teacher in the lower school grades one through five. And um, we have an interesting way of setting up our science program. If you've come through for a tour, you might have had an opportunity to walk through the Exploratorium. And our Exploratorium is a space where we have library, the library, um, our tinkering, and science all integrated. And so the reason we do this is because, just like you're hearing from everybody else, science doesn't stand in isolation. We know that all of our learning, everything that we do, learning about the world around us is all science and it's connected to everything. And our hope for, for this program is to help foster and man maintain curiosity throughout the learning journey. We want kids really to be engaged and see the relationship between all of their learning. So to give you a little bit of information about this, I'm gonna tell you about a third grade unit we've been working on where we've been doing 
um, some integration between social studies in the homeroom, science, and our tinkering program. And so in third grade, um, one of the year-long themes is water. And to help students understand a little bit more um, about water, in science we've been looking at different properties of water um, and exploring watersheds. And third graders went on a couple of field trips to learn more about this. Um, and then we thought, what else could we do to help them like visualize what they're what they're learning about, and so our so Rob, our our um, tinkering teacher, our educational technology specialist, he started working with some of the students to do some design work, and they we started off um, having them build fish, and thinking about that connection of water, and you're like, okay. Yeah fish live in water, but really the, the plan for this was bigger because after the water unit, we've been moving into forces. And so we had an opportunity um, yesterday to spend the whole day with third grade. We have these deep dive days where students have, um, they come five times a year to the Exploratorium and spend the entire day with us. And we're doing things where we're having opportunities to do big projects or either kick off a unit or have our summative task for a unit. And so yesterday, um, kind of connecting the two units, they had an opportunity to build mobiles because we're looking at forces right now. And so you can see here a picture of um, some of the students and just seeing the kind of the progression, how everything was connected here. And then when they came in yesterday, they had different size dowels um, that they had to build with, and they had to do a lot of collaboration here. They were in groups of five, which is not easy. Um, and so they had to work together and figure out where the balance points were and how they were gonna get this, this mobile to be functional as a mobile. So if you happen to be walking through the lower school in the coming weeks, you'll notice them hanging around and you can see how the students were able to get all this together. Um, so this is just one example of a way that we're, we're integrating all of the different subjects. We also, um, another thing with third grade is they've been working on understanding and learning about salmon. And so we're growing salmon eggs in the classroom. Today the tank got really cloudy and I had a little bit of a panic attack, but I think you know I cleared, cleaned the filter, so I think it's all gonna be good. Um, and then also in second grade, just kind of, you know, you'll, you've heard a little bit from Nicole too about just their, their study of community and our campus. And so one of the things that we've been doing with second grade is, is really thinking about our forest here. And so when we were out in the forest, we were looking at microhabitats and then the students said, could we, make our own habitats, our own small forest habitats, so that's what we did. And so you can see the students um, digging up, and then of course they found worms, and so that became a whole part of the project where they were finding worms, taking care of the worms, coming in every day to water the worms and making sure that they were nourished and had what they needed and putting the plants in. Um, and so they're, and throughout all of that, they're learning about the forest and learning about the different layers of the forest and seeing how all of the systems interact. And um, then thinking about our campus and the forest, we've been thinking about, okay, what are we gonna do to help our, our campus and make sure that we we're sustaining the environment here? And how can we, how can we make sure that we're ha we have um, bees coming? And so they thought, oh, we, we could, we need some something to attract the pollinators. And then it just turned out that we had some wildflower seeds. So we planted wildflower seeds to help for that. And the second graders are also helping with our garden. And so they've been helping thinking about the worms and compost. And so all of these things are connected. We also have on our campus something called a tiny forest um, where we have 500 native species that are in one small square. And they're just like the, the school, we had a, a, I guess it was only like a year, almost two years ago. And we planted all these small plants and now they're big and we are growing all these native species. So the students have been having opportunities to go and read the trees and read the plants and, and learn more about what um, we need to do here to help sustain our campus. So you can see some of the pictures of these small world habitats. The joy in learning. Evident right there, okay. Um, we also have you can see the worm collections, but it was it was it was really fun to see the kids stopping in on the way to recess to just take care of their worms. 
And then another thing is that as we're learning about our forest, we found out um, a couple of years ago that we have some big leaf maples here. And so we're, we're thinking about how we can use those too. So we're trying to tap the trees. Um, we had that cold, that cold uh, spell. I thought, okay, this is the time. And then of course the temperature went up to 60 degrees and we haven't been able to tap them yet. But we've, the students have all picked their trees that they wanna mark. So we had to think about like looking up at the canopy, do they look healthy? Um, and then now we're just waiting for another deep freeze so that we can, we can tap the trees, drill holes into them attach our, our tubes and our spigots and our, our milk jugs and just hope that we get some sap. Now, you, if you know anything about um, making maple syrup, it takes a lot to make a little bit of syrup. So it turns out that there is something called the Oregon Maple Project, which we'll be going to visit um, to learn more about that. And so if we get any sap, then we will bring it there and they'll, it'll go into the big sugar shack and then hopefully we'll get some. <laughs> The kids have already planned like a pancake party and um, or waffles, and so they they have these. I, I, I apparently, we'll be doing that anyway, but we'll see what happens. Um, so some of the things that we've been thinking about are just you know again thinking about native species and understanding the layers of the forest and what it is that we need to do to take care of our forest. And then the last thing I want to tell you about. I'm, if you've come into my space at all, you can tell I get really excited about all the things we're doing with science. And so we, in fifth grade, they have a year-long theme for social studies about change. And so chemistry fits in perfect to that. And the biggest question that kids generally have when they start, they come to science is, are we going to make things explode? And the answer is yes. And so, um, so we started chemistry and that was the big, Big question, and so we started out simply and looked at baking soda and vinegar and um, thought about different ways that we could create gas using those two objects, and then yesterday we took it further. And so the students had some chances to, to apply their own wonderings, like how are, what can we do with these objects? What would happen if we leave one of these um, chemicals out? What would happen if we add double of something else? And so you could see that um, yesterday they were, they were trying to I guess it was, yeah, on Tuesday actually. They were trying to think about these questions that they wanted to answer so that they had more responsibility and were engaged in what they were doing. And so I just had some fun photos that I wanted to share. And this is just kind of showing you the progression of the students. And I had lab coats for them and goggles and um, they were measuring really carefully. And so the first time they went through the experiment, you can see those first three show what they do. And then they wanted to do their own experiment. And you can see the excitement in their eyes. So um, it was really fun. Um, but they're also, again, learning about um, they're asking questions that are investigated, that they can investigate, not just like random questions. And then they're doing their research, they're documenting some of what they're learning, they're comparing results, they're sharing with each other, they're collaborating. All of those things are happening. And then just a few more photos. And so just to kind of give you a little bit some more information. Um, you know, our program is inquiry based. We do a lot of problem solving. Um, there is some curiosity that's driving learning. So we often ask at the beginning of a unit, like, what do you wonder about? And then our experiments and our explorations will, have, will answer those questions so that they're discovering the answers to their questions. Um, there's real world connections and everything is hands on. So I came across this, this quote and um, from Marie Curie and I just, Thought I would end with this. So, I'm among those who think that science has great beauty. A scientist in his laboratory is not only a technician, he's also a child placed before natural phenomena which impress him like a fairy tale. I put that sick in there so you know that I, I'm open to all genders. <laughs> anyway, um, so I hope that you get a chance to stop by the Exploratorium if you haven't already, and thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's always fun to hear directly from the teachers. I hope you do walk away with a real sense of what our program looks like. This is just a sampling. These are just four teachers who are exceptional, um, and our teachers are so strong. I, I hope you get the sense that um, our teachers are both pedagogical masters, but they're also deeply, deeply committed progressive educators, and this really shows up in the classroom. Um, we started the night with the idea that um, 
It's the little things that prepare kids for big things. And I hope what you heard and saw is that when we take time to value each bird um, and to talk about each child's bird, it prepares them for the big things. Or when we take time in mathematics and realize that third graders, they can really start exploring the distributive property. They can do that, um, and that prepares them for the big things. Um, that's really at the heart of the experience here at Catlin Gable, what we believe and the experience we want kids to have, um, preschool all the way through fifth grade and 12th grade too. So we hope to see you again. We've got some events coming up. We hope to see you at the visit days. If you haven't completed an application already, I'd encourage you to connect with Jasmine, connect with Jewel, and they can support you through that process. Um, our program team is really excited to get to know kids. We've got two dates, January 27th and February 2nd. Um, and it's always a delight for us to get to know your children. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out. Jasmine and Jewel can help connect you. And again, it's just been a really nice evening with you. And uh, thank you for joining us. All right, take care.